So on Tuesday, Apple announced four new products, but the thing that stood out to me most of all was not one of the products itself, but what was inside of it, and that is the new A14 Bionic chip. This gives us some insight into not just the upcoming iPhone 12 that's likely going to feature the exact same chip, but more interestingly, to me at least, it does give us some clues as to what we should expect for Apple Silicon processors going forward, whether that be for the iPad Pros early next year, or some of the first Apple Silicon Macs that we're expecting in about a month. In today's video, we're gonna break it down, do a little bit of uh, crazy math, and see what we can figure out. So I wasn't planning on making a video about A14 because really we didn't hear a whole lot about it. But as is typical with my brain, I seized on two little bits of information that Apple released during their keynote presentation. They said that the A14 has 40% more CPU performance and 30% more GPU performance compared to the old iPad Air. And those two numbers stuck with me. But the first thing to keep in mind is those numbers are actually pretty misleading. They said 40% faster, 30% better graphics, but they were comparing the new iPad Air to the old iPad Air, which had an A12, not an A13. So they're jumping a generation of chip in that comparison, which is questionable in terms of the validity of the numbers. But that does at least give us some context for the A14. Now the first thing that I started wondering when I saw these numbers was, well, how does the A14 compare to the A13, you know, its direct predecessor? Well, fortunately, we do have some information to go off of and it's pretty easy to work out exactly what has changed in terms of those performance figures. So to make it easier to understand, let's set the A12 as our baseline and we'll assign it 100 arbitrary performance points. Now, Apple revealed last year that the A13 processor was 20% faster in both CPU and GPU performance. So we'll put that at 120 points. Now, since we know that the A14 is 40% faster in terms of CPU performance, that puts it at 140 points, which is about 14 or 15% faster than the A13. Some sources have been claiming that the A14 is more like 17% faster, but we're just gonna go conservatively off of Apple's own numbers. So we're looking at about 14 or 15% improvement in the CPU. GPU is also pretty easy to work out. A12 is at 100 relative points. A13 comes in at 120. A14 at 130 for a performance gain of about 8%, which is not particularly impressive. So at first glance, that definitely does look a little bit underwhelming in terms of year-over-year -year performance gains. However, I think it's important to keep in mind that, well, for one, we don't actually have our hands on any A14 devices until October, so it's going to be a while before we can actually benchmark and test these chips. And two, it's an iPhone chip. It's going in an iPad Air and an iPhone. How powerful do you really need it to be? I suspect that Apple thought for this year it would make more sense to take the benefits of moving to a five nanometer process and apply that to shrinking the die, increasing the density, and improving efficiency, thus improving battery life. Those are three very important gains, whereas performance, how much more of that do you really need? What's interesting though is that now that we know something about the A14, about these new cores, we can extrapolate that data a little bit more accurately to figure out how future iPad Pros and Macs could stack up once they adopt this architecture. Now before we proceed to this next section, I want you to go grab the biggest bag of salt you can find. This is a hypothetical exercise that I'm sharing with you purely because I was curious and I ran the numbers and I felt like talking about it. This isn't based on any insider information or any leaks. This is just me having a fun little math problem in my head. A12, A13, and A14 are all six core big little designs, which means they have two high performance cores and four high efficiency cores. So for these past three generations, we see a refinement of that core design. It makes sense that we're not going to see massive performance gains 
without increasing the core count. That's what A12X and A12Z were for. That saw a massive increase in performance because it went from six to eight cores, doubling the amount of high performance cores. Because the A12X and Z have twice as many performance cores compared to the A12, they saw about a 45% increase in performance. Similarly, when comparing the GPU performance, the A12 has a four core GPU, where the A12Z has an eight core GPU, so its performance is about 50% greater. So if we add that to a chart comparing all of these relative performance figures, the A12 sets a baseline of 100, the A14 falls at about 140, and the A12Z falls at 145 when talking about CPU performance. As for GPU, we're looking at A14 at 130 points and the A12Z at 150. Where this all gets really interesting is that this year's Mac chip is supposedly going to be using a 12 core design. When the A12X doubled the amount of performance cores, they saw 45% better performance. And now they're gonna do it again, which means in the Mac chip, we can expect another, let's say conservatively 40% on top of the A12Z. That puts us at 185 relative performance points. But wait, that doesn't take into account the fact that these are gonna be A14 cores, not A12 cores. So they're more cores, but they're also newer, faster, more efficient cores, which means that we can tack on at least another 20%, and that puts us at 205 relative performance points. Theoretically, you could make the argument that we should have done 40%, because that's what Apple is claiming the A14 is compared to the A12, even though they have the same six core design. So arguably, this could be 225 relative performance points. That's amazing. But wait a minute, there's something else going on here, something a little bit familiar. Do you guys remember the video I made about a month ago where I looked at the performance gains of the A series and X series chips over the past couple of years, and I simply averaged it out and extrapolated where the A14 and the A14X would fall in terms of performance. You know what's interesting about this graph? It puts the A14 about 40% higher than the A12. Also, you can see that it puts the A14 just under the performance of the A12X, and oh, look at this. Look where the A14 is on our relative performance chart that we created today, right below the A12X and Z. Interesting. Now, if we shift our hypothetical lens over to the graphics for a moment, we're really not as certain what to expect here. Now, granted, the A12, A13, and A14 all have a four core GPU. The A12Z has twice as many cores. So their eight core GPU does perform significantly better. Now, we don't know what exactly this Mac chip is going to do in terms of graphics. Will it move to a 10 core GPU? Will it stick with eight? Are they gonna be better? Are they gonna be the same cores that you find in the A14, which means roughly 30% performance gains compared to the A12? We're just gonna assume that whatever the configuration is, this year's Mac chip will have about 30% better graphics. That would put the A12Z at 150 performance points when compared to the A12, and the new chip would come in at 180. Now I can't stress enough that this is a hypothetical exercise. This video is not really meant to say, here's what you can expect, and if it doesn't happen, I'm gonna shave off my eyebrows. This is basically just, you know, I was very curious. I started writing in a notes app, and then I figured, man, I'm gonna make a video about this and see what you all think. It's also important to remember that this assumes that whatever chip is going in the Mac is going to use the same basic cores as the A14. If you look at the single core performance between the A12 and the A12X, they're identical because they're the same cores, it's just that one chip has more of them. However, that might not happen here. But rest assured, whatever happens, I'm going to be chomping at the bit to get my hands on and test these Apple Silicon Macs. It can't come soon enough. I'm literally counting the days. Now, I do wanna make the same distinction that I made in the last video that raw performance, benchmark performance, or Apple's quoted percentage gain improvements 
aren't necessarily going to be true in 100% of the tasks that you do. This is Apple we're talking about. Optimization is the king here. That's why the A12Z can edit three streams of 4K, even though on paper it's about as powerful as a 10th gen Core i5. We didn't even start to talk about the second generation machine learning accelerators or the 16 core neural engine. Apple loves acceleration and optimization. Do you guys remember a couple of years ago when the Metal API meant you could program apps that took advantage of the full GPU capabilities? It was a lot more well optimized. This is like that on steroids. I'm sure that someday we'll run Cinebench on an Apple Silicon Mac and we'll be able to compare it directly to Intel, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be faster or slower in certain things. So. As I mentioned earlier, grab that bag of salt, reach in, get just fistfuls of salt, because even if the performance figures end up being accurate, the actual usability of these processors, thanks to those optimization things, is going to be wildly different depending on the application. So it's important to keep that in mind. But the thing that I'm keeping in mind most of all right now is excitement because I'm really looking forward to October. So that's gonna do it for today's video. As usual, thank you all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this weird little hypothetical exercise. Make sure to follow me on Twitter, at Luke Miani. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know your thoughts on this whole situation. And with that, I'll see you all in the next video.